everyone. Really nice to be here today. Tough hour, but we'll hope will be interesting enough for, for the time. It's my pleasure to be here today with one of the most influential voices in the world in AI, Professor Yoav Shoam. Yoav is a professor emeritus of computer science at Stanford University. He is the co-CEO and co-founder of AI21 and also serves as chair of the Scientific Committee of Israel's National AI Program. <clears throat> Throughout his career, he has bridged academia and entrepreneurship, found in several AI companies. I want to start when AI21 journey begins uh, and ask you what made you start a company and what was the vision back then? I, the answer is very short, but also long, but we'll make, we'll make it short. Uh, we saw the uh, emphasis on deep learning in AI as necessary. AI had pivoted back in the 80s were all about symbolic methods, had pivoted to statistics, and uh, increasingly under the header of deep learning. We thought that that was necessary in this day of abundant data and compute, but not sufficient. And we established the company to bring back reasoning and symbolic reasoning specifically into the world of AI. Thank you. Um, your main focus today is enterprise customers. Um, and we know that in enterprises, while a lot of individuals are using AI models to some extent, uh, gen AI application in production and wide deployment in organization are still pretty rare. I think an AWS survey done a bit more than a year ago so, says that only 6% of enterprises um, have such wide deployments. Why do you think this gap exists? It is striking, this discrepancy. On the one hand, in consumer land, the adoption of Gen AI, by the way, I hate the term, but I'll pick my battles, um, is unprecedented, faster than the internet, mobile, PC. Uh, in, in enterprise, on the one hand, uh, there's not no CEO in the world is not doesn't say I'm a, an AI first company or I want to become one, but you're right. The deployments are very far and free between, and I think there's there are a number of reasons. There's like standard reasons: new technology, you need to understand it, you need to understand the use cases that are appropriate, compliance, privacy, security. But I think the two things that are holding back actual deployment in the enterprise today, and um, that are specific to, the t to, 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 to Gen AI. One is cost. The uh, cost of deploying LLMs is inherently more than deploying traditional software. And so even if you had the perfect solution and you lose money, of, and, uh, you, know, you do customer service with AI, and every uh, you t pay 10 cents for each call, uh, that's not tenable. So that's one p issue. And the bigger issue is reliability. So. I think we've all experienced uh, how amazing Gen AI uh, can be, and I, I have to say I'm all, I'm constantly amazed by our own system that we built. I know they're built, and yet sometimes they do stuff that's amazingly brilliant, and then they're not. And when they're not, they're not just a little wrong. They can be totally ridiculous. And in the enterprise, if you're brilliant 95% of the time and total garbage 5% of the time, that's a non-starter. So those I think the two basic things that are holding back actual deployment in the enterprise. And by the way, in this day of agents, again, another term I hate, but uh, when you try to do more than a quick transactional use with an LLM, uh, sort of a, a longer flow uh, of multiple calls to LLMs and, and tools and search, and each one of these steps has a certain amount of error, those compound, and then you get more, n more, more noise than signal. So I think that's the main reason why you're, s you're seeing that. Yeah, it makes sense. We, we see companies like OpenAI and Anthropic raising many billions of dollars. Um, how can you compete with that? <laughs> uh, by, uh, by being different. Um, we made a deliberate choice. I don't know if it's a deliberate choice or we were guided into it by constraints, but to not try to build uh, we, we had a consumer application that was very successful, a writing assistant, but we didn't try to do this, uh, you know, chat system that would be everything for everyone. That's very expensive to do, not because it's hard 
uh, scientifically or technologically. It takes a lot of training, post-training alignment, and just a lot of work. Uh, so we didn't do that. We're focusing on enterprise, enterprise use cases. Uh, we're not multimodal. I don't care about drawing pictures of Donkey on the Moon or, or doing automatic movies. 80% um, of, the, of the, uh, the data in the enterprise is text. And what isn't text tends to be graphs and charts. So when we focus on that data and the use case in the enterprise, turns out you don't need to spend hundreds of millions and let alone billions for to train your systems. And so that's how we approach it. OK. Let, let's speak about how do you see the wider ecosystem evolving. So we hear different views about uh, the role of model companies in the value chain. Um, some say that it may be hard to harness value from doing only LLMs, and we see um, model companies starting to go after the application layer or down to the hardware layer, or even somewhere in the middle, like you're trying to do with the orchestration layer. So uh, how do you see this all evolving, and where do you think there will be opportunities for young startups to build and VCs to invest in? So uh, first of all, I totally agree that uh, it's a fool's errand to try to create another company that's doing general purpose LLMs. Um, so I agree with that premise. Um, there are multiple um, ways to enter this. Uh, and I think we're still not so much in the stage of land grab, but land formation. The very shape of the land is still you know, being created. So. First of all, the people who create special purpose LLMs for certain domains, certain use cases. Um, I, I'm not a strong believer for if that's all you do, but if you're creating a complete solution in a certain domain, which is AI-centric, that's not different from traditional software and power to you. I think you should do it. Uh, but then your moat is not your LLM per se. It's really your whole solution. Uh, and your product market fit and your stickiness with the customer, the traditional things. Uh, in terms of people trying to create core technology, uh, so yeah, there will always be applications on top of technology that's no different from databases or any, any stack that's built. And there'll be thousands of them, and most of them will fail, and a few will succeed spectacularly. So that's definitely there. Um, in terms of uh, actual, in the actual infrastructure, I think there's a really interesting opportunity to create new types of middleware. Uh, you can throw away phrases like you know AIOS or orchestration. Those we tend to use words in AI that aren't precise, and it kind of hurts us. But very much, we, we're now entering. We've entered the phase where. No, I, there's no single enterpr enterprise that I know who, the, whose solution is, I'm going to just call an LLM. They build an AI s a solution around it. And there's an opportunity to help people to create AI solutions. So we call these AI systems. Uh, AI systems that, as you said, orchestrate. But what do they orchestrate? Multiple calls to LLMs, different LLMs. So our maestro, for example, is LLM agnostic. will use our own. Jamba models, which have the benefit of being because uh, they have a special architecture that makes them efficient, especially in long context. Uh, but uh, but it'll, it'll use other th third-party LLMs just as happily, and you know custom code and and uh, and you know databases and everything, and optimize both the use of the resources, so you have a budget in terms of time and compute, uh, subject to which you optimize the execution and orchestration. And I think there's a very interesting opportunity to create value at that layer. That's, that's where we're playing. OK. And then the application layer will remain uh, dispersed? Um, I, like I said, I think the application layer, there's a ton of opportunity. It's not fundamentally different than the opportunity presented in the past for application builders, except now they have a new set of tools to work with called AI. OK. Uh, can you put on the hat of the chair of the Scientific Committee of Israel National AI Program? And let's talk for a second about the role of Israel in the global AI scene. Um, how do you see the government role and maybe our role as an ecosystem in, in fostering an optimal environment for AI companies to thrive here? 
Um, first of all, let me say that it's a uh, it's it's not an easy question to answer. Fundamentally, um, we first of all, where do, where do we stand right now as a nation in the uh, this AI race? Not in a terrible place, but this is an area we need to run to stay in place. Um, what are our strengths? We have very strong technologists. Um, you know. I know our own company, I've never seen such a concentration of talent, but there are other companies with very smart people in Israel and in technology. And Israel has also, to your first earlier point, Israel has become very good at crafting uh, applications. So I think our technology and product talent is a very, very important part of our strength. What are our weaknesses? Uh, first of all, AI, as, as we know, requires compute. And we don't have a lot of compute in Israel. You know, compute is something of an international. So you know, we don't have our own GPUs. But at any point in time, we're using thousands and thousands of GPUs that are running in somebody's cloud. Um, and you know, we have relations with all the hyperscalers. Nonetheless, Israel should have its sovereign compute. Uh, you might have seen that um, a f contract was just awarded to, uh, to a company to build uh, uh, its first AI, the first AI data center with on the order of, uh, I want to say, 3,000 GPUs, but I forget if it's two, three, or four, and whether it's the H200 or GB. But anyway, much more than we have right now. We have to realize that about two orders of magnitude less than Saudi Arabia and uh, UAE are, are, are have or are building. So we will never compete on that. So that's something we need to take into account. And uh, what I would love to see is a deep collaboration between Israel and some of our neighbors uh, that uh, where we leverage our complementary strength, um, their infinite compute power, you know, money, energy, our strength in R&D and uh, product, and really create a Middle Eastern uh, power hub. We do need to maintain these strengths. Um, you know, academia is an important uh, uh, source of, of, of our strength. Um, we don't have enough uh, professors doing core AI. We need to at least double the number. So there's a lot of work to do, and I think government needs to play an important role here also. Okay, great. I think our time is over. Unless you want to say which uh, animal you want to be like the other panels before us. <laughs> but uh, if not, then uh, thank you very much. Toda <laughs>